Well, hello, writers. Welcome to episode number 130 of How Do You Write? I'm Rachel Heron, and I'm so glad that you're here with me. Today, we are talking to Barbara Powell. If you do not know Barbara Powell, you soon will. She is a barracuda of an agent. I swear she is. She is not my agent. Um, I love my agent, but the agent I loved, I love second best in the world is Barbara Powell um, because she is just a take no prisoners, no holds barred, all the cliches, um, and yet she is never a cliche. She knows everything about the industry and she will tell it to you. So today we have a really fascinating discussion. I throw my normal questions out the window and she just sits down with me and answers questions. So um, she's hilarious. I believe that if we ever took a cruise together, we would definitely get thrown in cruise jail. I don't even know if there's a cruise jail, but I bet there is. And I bet that me and Barbara would end up in there. She's that kind of girl and I love her. And you will love her too. So please stay tuned for that. Um, what's going on around here? Well, I am slowly getting back to normal. It feels so good. I am back into my routine. I am uh, getting up early, getting my words done, <laughs> suddenly working on three different synopses and sample pages. So let's not talk about that. Um, but that's actually pretty fun. I'm playing with ideas on the page. I want very much to be writing a book and I'm not doing that right now. There's, I'm, I'm, business says that right now I need to be doing these synopses. So I am working on those, but I really can't wait until the day I'm just arms deep in a book and I wander in for two or 3000 words a day and wander out again, all stunned and confused and the world looks too bright when I come out of my writing cave. And then what I really long for is the revision stage. So right now I'm having um, daydreams of getting back into a book. So, but that'll happen really soon. I know that. And I am consciously embracing this time of play when things are just kind of showing up and I'm grabbing the ideas and throwing them out and keeping them if they work. So that has been fun. Uh, taught a great class at Stanford over the weekend, how to plot your novel. I love teaching that class. Someday I'll put together a quick little mini online course about it. Um, because <laughs> basically all it is, is all of um, the ideas that I've come to myself organically. And then quite a few ideas that I've absolutely stolen from other writing geniuses. And I always attribute these, of course. And sharing that with people and watching their brains as they, I don't want to watch their brains, watching their faces as their brains realize that, oh, there is structure behind this thing we're all trying to do well. It is learnable. It is doable. It doesn't make the job any easier, I think. In fact, writing a book with no structure is definitely easier. Absolutely. But writing a good book with no structure is impossible. And realizing that you can learn it and then accomplish it is really something I wish I had known when I was writing my second book. I wrote my first book with a good structure accidentally. The second book, not so much. That is when I learned how to revise, when I started to learn how to revise, because I didn't know how to revise. I didn't really have to do a whole hell of a lot of revision on my first book. Again, it came out of me organically right. <laughs> that meant I didn't know how to do it again. I didn't know how to replicate that. So I had to learn how to revise a book, learn what structure meant. So I really love sharing that. And that's super fun. Um, speaking of which, I have been teaching the 90 days to done class for these last three months. So this is um, our last month wrapping up. And I have to say that the people in this group are writing their books. They're finishing their books. Um, Two people have already hit their word count and it's only May 9th. They don't even need to do that till May 31st. Um, it is tremendous. It has been so, so, so much fun. And But I wanted to tell you that I am officially, as of today, when this podcast airs, opening up for registration, a 90-day revision. So I have had people begging me to offer this for years. Revision is my superpower. It is really, really what I love most about writing. Um, and I didn't come to it that way. I had no idea how to revise anything. This is not something they teach you in grad school 
at all. Um, but now I've written, <laughs> I've written such terrible books and made them into really good books that I can actually revise anything. And I know that that is my superpower when it comes to writing. I can revise anything. All I need is something to put my hand into. Um, but it's something that I learned and it was a process that is learnable, teachable. And so I'm offering this class. This will be the first time I'm doing this in this three month format. And I am inviting you first. Um, there's only 12 seats and I predict that those seats will go pretty quickly. So if you're interested in this at all, uh, sign up fast. You can go to rachelherron.com slash revision. Um, but basically I'll give you a quick overview. This is the only time I will do a sell on the podcast. I might mention it in the next two podcasts, but other than that, this is it. You don't have to listen to my voice. Talk about this if you're not interested in it. But um, this is for you. If you have a book that's at least 80% done, preferably 100% done. Um, but between 80 and 90 is also acceptable because personally I can never write to the very, very end of a book on my first way through. I need to revise the whole thing to get the very last 10%. Um, but uh, this is for you if you have a book that you've written. Um, it's especially for you if you have no idea how to start approaching this beast of a book you wrote that has 75,000 different limbs and starting points that never got to ending points and characters who fell away and who might have died. Who knows what happened to them? What is this book actually about? Is it a science fiction fantasy romance with um, military western, uh, what am I leaving out, tropes? Um, what have, what have you written? What do you do with it? Uh, this class is for you. And what do you get from it? You get a weekly one hour meeting in person on zoom. Um, all of us together in person, I guess I'm using face to face online. So I guess we're not in person at all, but we are all there at the same time looking at each other on the zoom. And it's really, really nice. Uh, you will each get a turn on the hot seat during the class. So you'll get not only my brain on your particular problems, but everybody else's brain too. Um, we meet at noon Pacific standard time on Thursdays. If you can't be there, if you've got work, if you can't get out of it, that's no problem. You get the live video replay later. Um, you will also get access to the Slack channel that has been kind of the, the heart beat of the 90 days uh, to done class. We're always in it. We're always talking. We're always encouraging each other. It is amazing. We share our victories and our defeats and there's even a channel just for whining, um, which is great because then when you're done whining, you go do the work. And you also get bonus videos as needed. Um, you will not get critique, but you may, who knows, meet somebody in there who's really a kindred spirit to you. And then you can discuss critiquing together. But uh, that is not something that we do in this class. The focus of this class is to talk about story structure and how to overlay it onto a book that has already been written, perhaps with no idea of structure in mind. Um, and then having the encouragement next to you as you do the work. Um, it costs $3.99 per month for three months, um, or you can save almost a hundred bucks and pay in advance $1,099. Lord have mercy, that's a lot. Rachel, you are screaming at your car radio right now. Who do you think you are? Well, number one, I think that I can get you to do your revision beautifully and have a pretty damn polished book as opposed to a first draft, which is supposed to be a mess. If you have a mess of a first draft, congratulations, you did it right. Um, it is also less than half of what this would cost for you and I to do this one-on-one -on -one together. Um, and I don't even offer that kind of coaching package anymore because I just don't have time to do it. Um, daily, if you'd like to think about like it like this, it's less than a single burger. It's a couple bucks less than a single burger at Chili's. And it, unlike the burger, daily could change your life. Um, so like I said, people have been asking me to teach my revision process for years. I am finally doing it. Sign up if you want to do it. It is refundable up to the first week of class. You can go to rachelherron.com slash revision to sign up for it. Um, Dozy is growling behind me in excitedness. Like she is so stoked about revision just the way I am. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear her. Um, so that's enough of a sales pitch. You never have to hear that again. And thank you for listening.
you want to do this class. I know you do. Uh, quick thanks to new Patreon members. Thank you, guys. You will now get the essays. And I want to thank um, Jenny Darlington. Jenny Darlington, you have a wonderful name. Uh, Cheryl Sevy and Carmen Butner. Thank you, Carmen, for upping your pledge. That means a lot to me. Now you're going to get my texts. So, yes, let's get into the interview with Barbara Powell. Barbara, if you're listening to this interview, um, now you know all about my revision class. <laughs> Please enjoy this with Barbara. I 100% know you will, and you will want to stalk her all over the internet, but safely, people, not to her house, just on the internet. Um, she's definitely worth being an interwet, internet. Uh, she's definitely worth your time in following her, is what I'm trying to say. So I hope you get your writing done. Happy writing to you. Please always reach out to me on Twitter, Facebook, email, anywhere, and tell me how your writing is going, because I do really, really, really want to know. All right, my friends, take care, and we'll talk to you soon. Okay, well, I could not be more pleased to welcome my guest today, Barbara Powell. Hello, Barbara. Hello, and I love that you're always could not be more pleased to introduce your guest. It's like every <laughs> single day. But I really could not be, not be more pleased. <laughs> I did not even know that you listened to the show. That's amazing. <laughs> how, dare you? how dare you, ma'am? How dare you? <laughs> so um, I warned you that I might give you an introduction without giving you an introduction. And I think I'm going to give your real introduction after I give you my my real real one which is the way I know you just through oh. my bestie Sophie Littlefield mm -hmm. and you are Sophie's agent and not only that you are Sophie's like partner in crime in so yeah. many different ways um you are an agent of the kind you just you take no prisoners you basically um have your clients and you do bloody battle for them and you come out victorious with like bloody money in your teeth mm -hmm. that yes that's <laughs> accurate that's an accurate description of like a tuesday sure <laughs> just a tuesday you should see thursdays and you're <laughs> this pretty blonde blue eyed but do not underestimate barbara powell that's my bio for you do not as well can you type that up for me i'll put it on the website <laughs> But your official bio says, uh, Barbara Powell began pu her publishing career as a freelance copywriter and editor before joining the Goodman Agency in 2007, but feels as if she truly prepared for the industry during her brief stint as a stand-up comic in Los Angeles. She has found success placing thrillers, literary suspense, young adult, and upmarket fiction, and is actively seeking her next great client in those gen genres, but is passionate about anything with a unique voice. Barbara also writes the column, Funny You Should Ask, in Writer's Digest, which... I love. Um, I just want to ask you questions about everything, but basically you're also a writer. You I mean, sure, write stuff. Extent, yeah, I write stuff. I have a column. I've been doing it for six years now. Yeah. Um, and I get the deadlines. I get the editorial stuff. I get that feeling of how dare you? I said something brilliant right there. What do you mean change it oh, to a certain extent? Out. So it's nice to have that taste as well. Um, and it's so funny when you named all the genres that I represent, I think Sophie Littlefield has written a book in every single one of those genres. Plus a couple um, extras. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just be Sophie Littlefield. What if all my clients are just Sophie Littlefield that just pen names for Sophie Littlefield. <laughs> I think that's actually possible, but it's possible. Yeah. Between us and um, between me, Sophie and Julie, the other day, we could not think of a genre that we have not written in. And that includes all the crazy, like, like monster yeah, porn. Like mermaid erotica. Exactly. Yeah. Every single yeah. thing has been done. So, so yeah. Um, what is your very favorite part of agenting? Oh, wow. Um, probably the facilitation of art, like the greatest job in the world is to facilitate art and to maybe get somebody whose voice wasn't reaching everywhere it could out there in a bigger way. Um, I love that. I love making the phone call. First, I love making the phone call saying, I love you. I love your work. I must have you. And then I also love making the phone call saying something like, well, today's the day random house offered or something. Those are my favorite days of my life. I just, that's the reason to do it. Um, I, I like everything about it. Everything about it is it's my whole skill set utilized in every possible way and my vocation and my passion are married into one and I'm very lucky that that's my truth you know like artists can say how do you manage though you have you have a pretty full stable and I know you personally and you are always actively looking for the next great thing too how do you manage time wise I mean you have um, kids you have I do a life yeah. I do, apparently. Yes, I see them every once in a while. Um, their names are Janet and Susie. Something. No, their names are Phil and Diane. No, I don't, you know, 
I'll look. I have it written down somewhere. Um, but they, uh, yeah, I don't know. I just, and you know, time management isn't one of my greatest skills um, because I have a hard time setting down the phone, the setting down the email, turning off the email. I find that going on vacation, if I try to put my phone away, I'm much more anxious than if I can just check one or two, three times a day. So that's the agreement we've come to. And Travis ah. says to me, you're always working. I say, or am I always playing? <laughs> it's all mixed together, right? And that's just how I am. You know, I'm wired to go 110 miles an hour or zero. That I don't really have between. I, I think that's one of the things I love about you is because I am exactly the same way. I am... 110 miles an hour or I have a migraine and I'm not moving for 12 <laughs> hours and that's how my brain takes me down it just shoots me in the head every once in a while and I've got it like a gazelle <laughs> um did you ever want to write or is this just what you wanted did you ever want to be the one writing the books you know I thought when I was a kid yeah that's what I kind of thought that I would do someday but as I did a lot of informational interviews in so far as do I want to be in the editorial side of things or on the agency side of things, I would just revert back to the saying that my whole skill set was really represented by the agent side of things. Yeah. So, and you know, writing the column is a great outlet for me, but yeah. um, I can't do what you guys do. I, I could, I, I don't know how you do it. I mean, I, I mean, sometimes I'm just in awe and also like you do it and then you do it again and again and again and again. And now you're 17 books in or 22 books in and it's just fantastic. And you know, I feel like in one of your, I think it was Sophie's episode where she said something about the thing that she likes the best is, to, is if she's surprised by a book, if she's reading a book and they can surprise you. And I still get that. I'll still be reading something and I think they're going to zig and they zag and I'm like, oh, and that's so much fun. And so again, it's my whole skill set on the agenting side. And I just, I don't think I could do what you guys do. I'm just... Oh, I, I think you could if you wanted to. You just <laughs> you just know where your skill set lies. Um, what? How do you take? I, I'm just going to ask you all the things I always wonder. Um, how do you approach editing your authors? Because I do know that you have a hand in that. Yeah, I when I sign a client, I've never signed someone and been like, I'm not touching a, a glorious word of this. You're a genius. <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure that's true. I'm pretty sure actually. That might not be the case for one, but um, to basically be like, I'm keeping my hands totally off this. And uh, I get in, sometimes I just have to do a little bit of tweaking. Sometimes I say, you know, the, the whole brother storyline has to go. It's slowing the pacing. It's doing that. And when I do all the editorial work, when I'm then ready to go out with my client, they've done it. I think you're welcome publishing. It's a <laughs> perfect book. It can go on the shelf today. And <laughs> you feel like a writer does. Yeah, that never happens. And like the editor's like, I love this. I want to buy it. But also we're taking this whole section out. We're moving this here. The book doesn't start there. It starts here. And they always do it better. Always. So yes, I do a lot of editorial work with my authors, but it is never the case where an editor then doesn't make it roughly 80 billion times better. That is that is my experience with my agent, Susanna Einstein. And, and, and she and I will just go around and around this, the book that is coming out in August. Like she made me revise that sucker in a big revision, like maybe four times, five times. And every single time I'd turn in a perfect manuscript to her and every single time she'd write back, I'm so sorry you're on vacation, but I've got to tell you, you haven't hit it yet. And, yeah. um, and I couldn't do it without her and she's always right. And then the editors are always right. And I, that's something I try to tell to writers as often as I can is that every editor and maybe I've just been lucky, but I've worked with a lot of editors and they're always 99% right. Even yeah. if I hate them at the I mean, moment, yeah. they turn out to be right. They know what they're doing. You know what you're doing. They're wizards. They're geniuses. I mean, I'm, I don't live in genius. I know a great French place there, but I don't <laughs> live in genius. I just go there a lot um, where editors, I feel just like live and writers too. They're just in this, in this soup of genius. Oh my gosh. What, um, what would you tell the new not the new writer, but the writer who has written maybe three books that are under the bed yep. and finally has this manuscript that they know they want to try to sell to New York through an agent. Like what, what do you want them to come to you with? I want them to come to me with already having a critique partner, critique group that they've worked with. That is the, the most important tool in your toolbox as You're an author. You're kidding me. Talk to me more about this because I've seen so many writers like devastated by critique group. So what is what is a good critique? Group a good like? critique group. Okay, so um, my saying about a critique group is always 
my saying about my work wife, Holly Root from Root Literary, which is this, like, you both have to secretly believe the other ones better than you. Because oh, if you both that. believe yeah. the other one's better at you, you, you keep challenging, you keep working, and you're honored to have their critique. Mm-hmm. And it, you know, and it's also the way I, I try to, the way I try to fight with my husband or argue with my husband is with a great deal of respect. I want to argue with him the way that I love him with a great deal of respect. And I think that's important with critique partners too. I have been, I mean, I can slaughter an author. I can be like, nah, no, try again. I mean, I was just making my client, Bill Schweigart, laugh because I just was writing the horrible things in the margins, you know, track change in this thing. It's like, no, awkward, no, meh, stop doing this. And I don't, <laughs> not really thinking about this. I'm not a very nice critique partner, but I think to have that group or that person that is sounding off with you is so important. Um, and that's what I would really stress. Attending uh, conferences, fine, but being a part of a writer's group, being a part of an organization, whether it's ITW, RWA, you know, there's all these organizations that you can be a part of that you can then find those critique partners or those people that will be your first readers in. Oh, well, let's talk about first readers. And I'm pretty famous for saying this, but you shouldn't be able, you shouldn't be sharing any fluids with your first reader. They cannot be your... <laughs> your no, no fluid your, bonding. No fluid bonding. They can't be your partner. They cannot be your child. They cannot be your mother. They cannot, you know, they cannot share fluids with you because there's so much else that's coming into their idea of what you're writing when you do that first cousins are fine because first cousins are like brutal but also they love you you know but no direct fluid (laughs) one of my biggest fights with my wife ever was with my first book and she read gosh it must have been like the draft that got me Susanna my agent and um and she said that my hero was just an asshole and I was so furious he wasn't an asshole he was an alpha male and why didn't she understand that and then, of course, you know, my editor, I think, my, yeah, my book had been sold and my editor came back and said, well, he's really an asshole. And I was like, well, she's right. You were <laughs> wrong the way you said it. But, I mean, yeah. it lasted a good day and a half. Like, you can't. Yeah. And that was pretty far down in my journey. If she, if we'd had that kind of confrontation argument beforehand, that could have killed us. Okay, so what else are you looking for in your dream client? Um, I'm looking for someone in the first couple of years is going to say yes and. It's an Absolutely. old comedy thing, but yeah. yes and. Um, I'm looking for somebody who isn't afraid to speak up when they're scared, but also isn't asking questions that they've been told to ask that they don't know what to do when I answer them. Like if you ask me a question and I answer it and you don't know why you asked it or what the answer means, I'll know. And I'll be like, who told you to ask that? And then we can figure out what you're really asking, you know, what you're really afraid of. But I think, um, and, and please live in the joy of it. The, from the moment you finish your book to the moment you submit it, to the moment that agent calls you, to the moment you get that book deal, like sit in those moments of joy because it's gonna happen once, it's one time. The first publishing year is one time. Those first 18 months, you never have that again because after that, you're just in the machine, you know? And you start I love to- that you say that. I love that. I, I still remember um, Susanna sent me an email that was all caps. It was just a subject line. Call me the minute you wake up. And it was, oh. and it was six in the morning. I just happened to glance at my phone. Yeah. And it was, and I went to my, I went right into this room and I called her and she said that not only did we have an offer, but we had three other offers and it was going to auction. And I sat in my office and cried for a while. And then I ran through the house and I jumped on top of my wife and woke her up like on, you know, kids do on <laughs> Christmas morning. And it was the best thing ever. And then my, and then I went into my office again and I called my friend Janine, who's kind of like the surrogate mom for me because my mom had died two years before that. So I called her and she was the first person I called. And, and it was just like the magical dream moment. And you get to do that. And I know Susanna all the time. It's really, yeah, it's really, (sighs) it's the greatest job in the world. So when do you read, as Susanna says, when do you read books with covers? Anytime I can, that's also part of my job. And I think that anytime somebody says, I don't have time to read, I think what they're saying is I don't have time to prioritize Yeah. that. And I just, I make myself prioritize it. I'm a big bathtub reader. I like to read in the bathtub. Um, and I usually have like three or four books going at any given time. One of them's, you know, it's like a nonfiction. One of them's probably, you know, could be any different kinds. But I, I'm a big bathtub reader. And I believe that you need to, you need to be reading what's out there. And also I, I love reading. So what's your favorite, your personal favorite genre to read for fun? Oh, you know what? I'm going to say I plead the fifth on that. I'm going to <laughs> that's plead probably fifth. safe. That's probably safe. Um, <laughs> did you know that I'm in your book club? My book club? <laughs> 
<laughs> you didn't even know you had a book club. But you have a book club with Sophie, and you guys read books together. And oh, she right, yes. always emails me or calls me and says, oh, by the way, we're reading this book next. Yeah. And um, and then a lot of times she'll read it, and then she's so nice because she'll buy it. And then she gives it to me to read, so I don't have to buy yeah. it. And it's wonderful. Yeah, we... So I read a lot of the books you tell me to read, and you didn't know that. Oh, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So you could probably guess. You could probably figure it I out. I think I know um, what your genre is. But, yeah. yeah. And I think – but I think it is important, too, to, to flex those other muscles. Like, I used to competitively swim. And if you're always swimming in the butterfly, fine. Why are you always working out the – now you got to do the backstroke sometimes. And so what I like to do sometimes is pick up something I wouldn't normally pick up. And what's interesting is having young kids is all of a sudden I got into picture books. So then I started representing a few picture books here and there. Oh, wow. And now my six-year-old is reading middle grade. And so now I'm like, I'm starting to figure out middle grade a little bit here. So I might dabble in that a little bit more. So it's really interesting how things get introduced to me, and then I try it out. Now, one thing I don't have any palette for, and I wish I did, was graphic novels. I think they're so cool. I think they're great. You know, you get you know reluctant readers in there with them too. But I can't, I can't figure out what I like, and I can't figure out my taste on that. So I usually refer that kind of stuff to Victoria Marini at my agency. I have a theory about graphic novels for some of us who are maybe a little bit more. Um, frenetically type A, possibly. Um, I have no idea what you mean. (laughs) (laughs) Because my wife is super, super into graphic novels. um, And we're actually like writing one together. I wrote the story. She's drawing it. But when I look at a graphic novel or a comic book of any kind, there is too much noise. It's just too much information. It's like overly stimulating. I need to figure out every single word, why the author put it there, why the faces are doing this. And you might be onto something. You know what I mean? It's just yeah. too much. It's like walking into Lush and everybody trying to stab you with soaps. I just can't. It's like, that's what a graphic novel is in my brain. <laughs> <laughs> that I think that's incredible insight. That might be the case. Yeah. That might be the case. Oh. So yeah, I think for reading for pleasure, I read all kinds of stuff. Um, but then for work, I only, I would say roughly, I probably do 95% fiction, 5% nonfiction. Mm. And any nonfiction I take on is some kind of element of the world that I want to be a part of a conversation, a conversation that I think is important. And then that's usually why I'm taking on that nonfiction. Like what? I don't even know any of your nonfiction. Oh gosh. Um, so my author D Watkins, his next book, we speak for ourselves is coming out at the end of April. So, um, he is his first book, the cook up is just an incredible memoir. And when I read it, I called him up. He sent it to me you know, on submission. I called him up and I said, listen, I have no business representing this. I don't know enough about this category, but I can't live with myself if I don't try, if I don't just try to plead my case to you. And like, I was talking, I was, and he's like, no, yeah, I want you, we're good. Like that's how you can <laughs> So <laughs> I just think that he has, um, he's such an amazing human being. I feel like he is really, putting his shoulder up against the boulder insofar as race relations and just having conversations. And I just want to put my shoulder next to him on that boulder. Oh, that's and so he, fabulous. That's the kind of books that I, that I want to represent in nonfiction conversations that I want to be a part of that. I, I just want to put my shoulder against the boulder with. That's amazing. And I need to read that book because you, I, I am passionate about memoir, reading it, teaching it and writing it. So, mm-hmm. um, what, What else do you say to the author who is, who wants to become traditionally published? What is important? Talk to me about um, what they should be doing about networking or about growing their craft or what do you, what are you looking for in, when you Um, look at the perfect author? Yeah. The very first thing you look for is just a damn good book. It doesn't matter what genre, it doesn't matter anything, but you know, again, that what surprised, what surprised me about it. And I, and The rest of America, maybe, I mean, I couldn't, I don't know if you know this fact, I don't know how many books the average person reads a year. I have no idea. But I'm about 300. And I mean, for funsies. So like, I don't know where, you're right, I don't know where my time fits. (laughs) Because I bet the average American is something like two, maybe maybe one, and then avid readers maybe 10, and then there's us. Right. But yeah. And so I am seeing so much material. I'm seeing what's out there. I'm seeing what's coming in. I'm seeing, you know, my client's third and fourth book that's not coming out till two years Mm -hmm. from now. So I am, I'm just awash in books. And so I think that just being a really good writer is something you you don't have to have a, you know, a book that's never been done before because that doesn't exist. But being a really good writer is important. The craft technique and detail of actually writing a book. Um, And then I would say like, again, you know, the critique partner is a big thing, but the difference between traditional publishing and self-publishing is you, you have to have a little bit more patience with traditional publishing. Self-publishing, you're going to start to decide when, where, why, and how. 
traditional publishing, you, you're not. You have a whole team of people helping you to decide that. You know, we're all working together, um, helping you to decide that, but you have to relinquish some of the idea of what control, what the word control means to you. Um, anything from price points to covers to release dates to promotion, publicity, marketing, all that, all that is going to be so nuanced when you're doing it with the whole traditional tribe of people right, rather than just doing it self-pub. Not to say that one's better than the other. Everybody gets to do how they want to do it. Um, but yeah, I would say patience is going to be a little bit of a difference. Mm. I don't have any patience. So that's the one thing I definitely struggle with a little bit. Like I sent an email and then I'm like, well, did you get it yet? And they're like, you sent the email four minutes ago. <laughs> yes. <Yeah>, so <laughs> what do you do in your brain with the, um, with, with, oh gosh, I, just, I have a friend who fired an agent last year for not getting back to her within like four or five months. And that was her agent. This particular well, agent also like did a bunch of other shady things. It was a good firing. It was a very good firing, but yeah. you're not like that. And, and my Susanna is like, I send her an email and I get something back immediately. Generally. Yeah. It's usually I, it's something like, just call me, Rachel. You're freaking out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is not I, email worthy. <laughs> I really try in the first 24 hours to get back. I really try. Also my clients have like my cell phone number. They, sometimes I'll just get a quick text from somebody being like, I, Sorry for doing this, blah, 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 and I just fire off a yes or no or whatever. It's fine. Yeah. Um, I have. I will say now that I'm in my <laughs> um, and I do have children and I do have a husband. They do like to see my face every once in a while. That my actual reading of manuscripts time, whether it's requested or client stuff, that has been the one thing I've noticed. The the getting oh, back, bet. especially on a second or third revision, mm -hmm. I can't get you right back in the queue again. So I'm not, I'm, you know, what used to take me a week or two is now probably taking me three or four weeks to get back to, but you know, I've got 50 clients and they're understandable and, that's and then amazing. we get it and run with it. Yeah, they're, they're fine. But that's the one thing. And I have to come to a place of acceptance with that. Yeah. I don't have all the time in the world. And I do like to look at my husband from time to time. Well, he's very so, handsome. Thank you. Isn't he though? Oh my gosh. He's so cute. <laughs> Right. <laughs> this is a, this is a random question, but um, do you ever do you ever are you ever reading a submission and you're like, please don't let me down, please don't let me down, please don't let me down, and then it lets you down? Yes, all the time. That do literally you... just happened last night. No. Yeah. Yeah. That I don't want to. If they're going to be a date, they don't know what date it is or time it is or anything, right? Because I don't want if someone listens. No, to this I don't even know when this is coming out. I think it's coming out. In so a yeah, weeks. um, I got all the way. I, probably I would say you know I'm read on devices, so it was probably like eighty percent through. And I was like, wow, I'm starting to get that feeling. I had a couple of little red flags, and I was like, I'm starting to get that feeling. This is really amazing. And then it, it just took a really heavy left turn, <laughs> and then it got real uh, violent, and um, then it just got very odd. And it, I was like, oh, no, this isn't even fixable. This is terrible. But I read all the way to the end in case I was like, are you okay? Should you drink some water? Like, what's <laughs> happening in the book? Like, I don't don't know it was like I was reading along reading along and boom goes the dynamite like I don't know what just happened so um I wrote a very long letter today actually saying thank you so much for thinking of me and this is um I'm going to be stepping aside and this is why but I will say it you know and how much do I want to say like wow you really lost control of the ship there friend like you know I don't know how to describe to them as precisely as probably they'd like me to on what happened there, except yeah. to be like, you had it and then you lost it. And it was so lost. Well, if that, that if that person ever gets back to you and says, you terrible agent, you can't even, you just say, this is the episode of Rachel's podcast that you should listen to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say it like every time someone's like, you, you dummy, I'll show you. I'll be like, hey, listen to this podcast. <laughs> this, was you. this was you. This was And I you. do, every once in a while, I do get those letters to that like, well, yeah. I bet Thanks you. for nothing, chump, and I can't wait to see you when I'm getting my Academy Award or whatever they say. And then you literally, <laughs> you mime dodging the bullet, right? Like, that's just <laughs> no. bullet Yeah, dodge. I do the Matrix dodge. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and this is a purely per, uh, um, selfish question. I, yeah. I don't know if Sophie told you, but I'm going to Thriller Fest for the first time. Oh, we're going to have so much fun! We're going to have so much fun, but what am I supposed to be doing there? Like basically, it's so this hard. Is, this is what you I'm just, gonna do. Is I'm just gonna let stand Sophie around and you and you have cocktails and you laugh. <laughs> it. it is the cool. Here's why I love Thriller Fest. I mean, if your people can't see me right now, but I'm just like hopping up and down. They can't see you. This is but, also a, a pod. Uh, if they want to watch you, they can watch you. <laughs> Wait, people can see me? Yes, that's why you look I so didn't pretty. Know that. You have eyeliner on and everything. But <laughs> I don't I do that. No, maybe I didn't tell you that. Oh, that might be my bad. You did not tell me. <laughs> 
Usually there's a policy I send out a thing saying, here's what to expect. I forgot I didn't do that with you. <laughs> you look beautiful. I would have told you. But anyway, go on, sexy. Anyway, as I was saying. <laughs> okay, wait. So here's why Thriller Fest is amazing. Because I can be standing there to somebody who is working on the craft and still has never submitted anything. Talking to them. And then Lee Child is right here. And Nick Petrie is right here. Oh, and then here comes you know, Tom Colgan. And it's like, everyone's just having conversations. Everyone's chill. Everyone's just happy to be there. You know what it feels like? And I hear people say this every year. It's like summer camp. It's like, we all come together for four or five days. We have a rip roaring good time. And then we say, see you next year. And it's just nobody, I don't, and maybe I'm just living in a fairy tale land, but I don't feel any ego there. Everyone just wants to be there to help each other. I've seen my authors walk up to people and ask for blurbs and they're like, absolutely. And they follow through with it and give them one. I mean, it is just a summer camp kind of conference. I highly recommend people to attend that conference. And it's in New York City. I'm so excited. I cannot be more excited about that. That's mm -hmm. so cool. And we're going to be hanging out together. So if anybody is at Thriller Fest and sees the beautiful Barbara oh. and tall Sophie and me, their little friend, <laughs> come, come over and say hello. <laughs> you are just so delightful. Thank you so much for being on the show. Um <gasps> Yeah, and I'll, I'll and I will link your link your uh, um, everything on the website. You can be found at irenegoodman.com slash barbara dash poel, oh, and you. you're always looking for the next greatest thing. I am, and it's gonna be somebody, right? Yes. I'm gonna sign somebody soon. Like it's gonna yeah, be that's, somebody. That's what you do. So, so yeah, that is what I do. <laughs> so um, yeah, so I'll meet you at that great French restaurant in Genius. In Genius, I love that place. <laughs> Okay, this my friend. So much fun. Take care. Thank you so Thank much. You. Bye. All right. Bye.